aire. Eso, requested by Amelia. I think a few more seconds. Dear colleagues, I'm Filippo Crea, editor-in-chief of the European Heart Journal. Welcome to our monthly dialogue. EHJ dialogues have been so far very, very successful, and uh, it is a nice occasion, a nice opportunity for a meeting among editors, authors, and, uh, and readers. I remind you that dialogues are free, they are live streamed, and then they are posted on YouTube. If you don't have the uh, opportunity, the possibility of, uh, of following the dialogue today, you will find it in uh, YouTube. They are free. And of course, your participation with your questions is important. You can ask questions and uh, we are ready here to give you answers. And today uh, I have a, a great privilege. The privilege is to introduce our, uh, our guest, who is one of the legends of cardiovascular medicine. The guest today is uh, Fayez Zanat, and the uh, topic today will be challenges and pitfalls in the interpretation of clinical trials. And I will lost uh, Fayez with Rudolf de Boer, who is uh, our brilliant associate editor for heart failure. And uh, Rudolf, please, let's start our dialogue today. Yes, thank you very much, Filippo. And um, I will start off with briefly introducing Dr. Fayez Sanat to you all, although I believe he needs a little introduction, but I will, I will mention a few highlights. So, so just for us to realize how lucky we are. Uh, Fayez Sanat is an emeritus professor of therapeutics and cardiology and was head of the division of heart failure at Nancy in France. Um, he's well known being the founder of the Global Cardiovascular Clinical Trial List, CVCT Forum, which will start tomorrow. Um, with meetings in Paris and in Washington, D.C., but also in Asia and the Middle East, so really a global initiative. He has published more than 750 peer-reviewed papers and uh, received various accolades, such as the um, uh, Award of the European Society of Hypertension in 2014, the Lifetime Achievement Award of the ESC Heart Failure Association in 2017, and he was a Eugene Brownwald Scholar at Harvard Medical School. But I think Dr. Sanat is best known for his brains and creativity, being a leader in the field of heart failure, having pioneered the importance of aldosterone and mineraloreceptor corticoid antagonists in heart failure. And he's been the PI and leader of numerous trials. So, so I think we're very lucky again to have you. I'd like to uh, say welcome to you on behalf of uh, the ESC. And maybe we can start with a personal question, if that's okay with you. Um, you were born in Tunisia and then moved to France. And um, we were wondering, was it an easy transfer for you, for you to come to Europe and did you have to overcome any hurdles? Yeah, thank you. I would like to, to thank first the European Heart Journal to get me on this dialogue. I feel very honored and privileged. And, and thank you for mentioning my uh, birth place, which is Tunisia. Indeed, I transferred in France when I was 21. It was in the early 70s. It was a very smooth uh, move because I started my medical education in Tunis, uh, a faculty of medicine, uh, and uh, I got uh, my rest of medication here in Nancy and then in Paris. The, the, this was really a, a definitive decision for me because I wanted to get this internship because uh, this is a very specific uh, track of training in France. And um, uh, so far I have been enjoying this experience. Tunisia is very, very tiny country, and I'm sure some of the people listening to us do not know where it is. It's in North Africa, and uh, it has a very common uh, culture and background to France. So basically, I started learning French uh, very early or when I was six years old, and therefore the transition was very easy. And I transitioned here in the early 70s. This was short after the 1968 revolution. And therefore, this was plenty of peace and love. This is the period of peace and love. And, and therefore, I enjoyed it very much. Then 
it is only later when I started to be competitive, then of course I started to be competing with locals. And this kind of uh, was tough because we, I didn't really have uh, an easy ride there because uh, um, sooner or later, you, uh, at least in France, you are faced with this, what they call national or local preference. So I had to wait long before I got tenure and I got uh, uh, my professorship position. But then uh, everybody, everything went uh, right and I had the privilege of meeting great people and uh, really um, feeling myself uh, uh, very French, uh, although now I have uh, the double citizenship, I'm Tunisian and French. Very, very interesting. So just trying to imagine there in 1968, probably with long hair and well, it was a lot of time. Um, so, so moving towards science, uh, um, we noticed that your first publications were on digoxin and also rubidium uptake in the red blood cells. Uh, can, can you maybe share with us, how did you get interested in science and, and maybe these topics? Well, you must have dug into the archives of the European Heart Journal because actually my very first publication was it, it, the European Heart Journal. And it was about rubidium and digoxin. I, I was, of course, extremely proud of it because this was <clears throat> my thesis work. Uh, digoxin was everywhere at that time. We had only digoxin to treat heart failure and Lasix, of course. And uh, we had trouble using digoxin because it's toxic. So we already started forced by the toxicity to find out uh, personalized medicine and try to optimize digoxin use. And I thought that just measuring digoxin levels in the blood would not be sufficient because the pharmacokinetics of digoxin is varies all the time. So I thought, well, how if we go to the target and then the bio target is sodium potassium ATPase, uh, you know, enzyme, uh, because at that time this was the dominant mix fraction. And in order to uh, track the effect on sodium potassium ATPases, I thought we should track the uh, changes of uh, exchanges of potassium. Rubidium and thallium are calcium mimetics. They are very similar to potassium, and therefore we elected to go to red blood cells. And uh, uh, this is in itself was really an important discovery because we thought we found that in the red blood cells, we have a sodium potassium ATBS and we could monitor the effect of digoxin on fluxes of potassium in red blood cells. And this was actually my first experience with a kind of uh, bio targets and biomarker optimization of therapy. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, this was my uh, 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 privilege to have uh, my very first publication in European Heart Journal. Yes. Yeah. Well, and and look and look what a what a great journal it has become. So so thank you for contributing that work. Um, I, I think you are probably uh, best known for your contributions uh, to our understanding on the role of the mineralocorticoid receptor and and the antagonists and and heart failure. It's regarded a, a milestone in the history of heart failure. Can, can you tell us something about, about this story, about this saga, how it came about and, and um, who you associated with and worked with? We are very curious. Yeah, we, we lost you there for a second. Are you still there? Yes, uh, th oh, yeah. thank you for this question, because uh, this is really, really was foundational for all my career and certainly my line of thought. Uh, it's how to um, uh, look out of the box, uh, typically. Uh, and actually, in the way, the story you develop, develop about the junction was kind of uh, also uh, preparing for this, uh, which is looking to biotargets in tissues which are available uh, in uh, to, for, for monitoring. And, and certainly at that time, I was privileged to live and to practice in France where spironolactone was extremely popular. 48% of hypertensive people were taking spironolactone in a way or another, usually combined with the thiazide. And this was thanks to the seminal work of uh, Joël Menard and the School of uh, uh, Paris, who uh, has contributed so much to the understanding of aldosterone. And then another researcher, basic science research in France, has discovered that there were MR, mineral crystal receptors, in the atrium. So said, I was taught in the school that aldosterone target are only the kidney. And of course, this really came as a, a very important uh, a bell 
that drank that we need to look out of the box. And of course, I developed this theory that, uh, uh, well, even under complete blockade of the uh, renal energy system, uh, aldosterone is not under control because everybody was thinking that actually you don't need to take care of aldosterone because if you block the system upward, then aldosterone will decrease which wasn't true. And I had to dig in the literature and find out actually that it, what since had been called the breakthrough or escape phenomenon, even under a heavy control of the system, you have a doctrine which speaks back. So this was the first uh, important finding. And the second is indeed the extra renal targets in the heart and in other tissues. And there is some reason that these uh, receptors were there. There must be, you know, mediating some other extra sodium potassium mechanism. And again, uh, we tried to find in the literature elements which uh, uh, could actually demonstrate that. And of course, we were faced by the textbooks. The textbooks said, well, we cannot combine uh, a, a mineral receptor antagonist with an ACE inhibitor because you will run into trouble with worsening renal function and hyperkalemia, and I, when I first tested my ideas with the clinical pharmacology working group at the French Society of Cardiology, well, a lot of my, uh, you know, uh, senior people say, you are crazy. You are gonna be uh, getting every uh, patient in the dialysis. But it happened that good ideas never come uh, at a single time to a single person. <laughs> Bert Pitt was having the same ideas and I didn't know Bert Pitt at that time. I didn't know him. And I met him precisely at the ESC meeting. It was in Nice long ago. And he was discussing about the potential to try uh, a MR antagonist in heart failure patient. Of course, I jumped in it and I said, well, <laughs> this is precisely my idea. And he was uh, keeping knocking in the door of the boss of Searle at that time because, you know, uh, Shell has disappeared. Uh, uh, it was under the umbrella of Monsanto at some time, and then the product was with Pfizer. But anyhow, he knocked on the door of uh, John Alexander, who was <coughs> the boss of, uh, and he was a pain in, it, it really a pain in the neck of, of, of John Alexander until pay, John said, well, we are not making any money of Spiracton. It costs only cents. How are you, you would like me to conduct a, a, a mortality trial? But eventually, to make a long story short, we did have this trial. But the convincing piece came from uh, the uh, conceptual framework paper that I published in the American Journal of Cardiology in 1996. And this prompted Bert to do the trial with what we called at that time the atrial natriuretic factor. It wasn't called BNP at that time. With a deduction uh, with, uh, with pyrolactone used at very small doses. This was the trick. We had to use it at 12.5, 25 milligram. Until then, we were using it at 150 milligram. And then with this small dose, we could demonstrate that there was a very significant decrease in MT pro BNP. And this opened up the door uh, to sponsor the RAS mortality trial. So this was a nice story. And actually the uh, RAS trial uh, design, I wrote just immediately after consensus trial, and this was after intense lobbying from several guys here marketing, by the way, in France, who asked me to draft a protocol for them. And then we made bridges with Bert Pitt, and this is how this, it started. Yeah, and, and we're still using it every day now. And um, I, I realized that this wasn't, this was a, a long ride, but it's a great story. Um, and, and, and probably um, um, in line with that, or as an extension of your interest, you have also contributed majorly to our understanding of, of comorbidities, and in particular, renal function and renal dysfunction. Can, can you summarize for us what, were the, what are the main impl implications of, of this line of research? Well, absolutely, a very important topic because, of course, uh, I came into it because uh, the implementation of uh, MRAs were really very much opposed by the worsening renal function and certainly the limitation of use in, in this medication in patients with CKD. And uh, when we've seen the very poor rate of implementation, we did realize that actually almost every heart failure patient has CKD. Almost everyone has CKD. So we came to the idea that actually these are coexistent diseases and maybe the single disease, by the way. And we have written a paper called on the On My Mind section in circulation 
were revising the cardiorenal syndrome, which is, uh, uh, of course, used in different circumstances by Claudio Ronco, but we have been using it as a single disease. Uh, people can present themselves uh, as having heart failure sign and symptoms, and then their diagnosis have been heart failure, but they have already underlying CKD. If you dig for it, you will find it. Sometimes people are just diagnosed first and having CKD because somebody had met their EGFR, but if you test them for anti-proBNP or for echocardiography, you will find that there is cardiovascular disease already. So therefore, we had to move away from the concept that uh, the cardiologists are always saying, well, the heart is the victim of the uh, kidney, and nephrologists say the kidneys are the victim of poor output yeah. from heart failure. But it happens that actually it goes both ways. Uh, and, and therefore, we got very much interested in this area of uh, comorbidity with renal diseases. And I have heard that this new word recently used at the American Heart Association, which is called renalism, like racism. Well, this is a very important word that depicts very nicely the situation because most of patients with CKD are excluded from our cardiovascular trials yeah. for many reasons, because they are troublemakers, they have lots of safety concern, and uh, there are pharmacokinetics, which hasn't been tested uh, in this special population that we, and by excluding them. So the level of evidence with people with CKD is so thin that we are only improvising and adapting to this population what we have learned from non-CKD patients. So luckily, through this intense lobbying and work, now we are moving into an area where renal endpoints and concomitant CKD is really a prime stage and certainly from the HDLT2 inhibitors trials and from phenerenone, the uh, most recent uh, mineral receptor antagonist which is precisely targeting these patients with both the comorbidities. Yeah, yeah, and I think I, I agree. And as a result, probably of your of your hard work and, and, and of others, we now see also the, the threshold for EGFR is 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 lower than it used to be, eh? especially in the STLT2 inhibitor trials. And I think very valuable. So 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 um so you, I, th I think over the last 30 years or so, you, you, you have been part of, an, of kind of a, an evolution in our understanding of, of heart failure. And, and if you look back, what, what, what do you believe have been the main steps in, in this improvement in understanding of the mechanisms of heart failure? Well, I have uh, developed uh, the notion that we have been uh, very much, uh, you know, um, thinking in the box. So we need to think outside the box uh, very frequently. And this is typically the case here. We have been very cardiac centric, uh, very systolo centric, if any, and uh, by the way, also very myocyte centric. So we need to get away from the heart failure as it been, being just hemodynamic and uh, cardiac disease. Uh, well, this has been done now because we have uh, uh, medication which work on the neurohormones and uh, targeting cardiovascular and heart failure as a system disease. So this was a very important progress in heart failure. Now, of course, thanks to the work of Janice and uh, Mark Pfeffer, we got back to the heart with the remodeling only to find out actually this remodeling is actually the consequence of uh, systemic neurohormonal activation. And it goes hand in hand with renal disturbances. And therefore we need to get away from the heart in order to understand heart failure as a cardiorenal disease. The other thing is that we have been spending so much time on ejection fraction and systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure. Uh, we are now ha having the hint that we may need to move away from this. And certainly signs of this is the success of, uh, a player, uh, of uh, empagliflozy in patient across the full spectrum of ejection fraction. So whether we need to measure ejection fraction before we need to use a natural ELT2 inhibitor, we may not need this because this we have for the first time a medication which may be effective not only on uh, low EF but also high EF. So maybe we have been also too much systolocentric and by the way in uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, there are elements of diastolic dysfunction and vice versa. In half that we have already some systolic dysfunction. So we need to understand this disease as a continuum. And ejection fraction was actually creation 
of trialists. <laughs> and uh, I have been participating in this because uh, we had to select patients at high risk in order to increase the event rate and decrease the sample size. And therefore we went to the best risk predictor at that time, which is indeed ejection fraction. We may not need this anymore. We may select patient with heart failure only based on anti probability which could be a great way to enrich uh, risk in population. And finally, the uh, myocyte-centric view. So we have been very much obsessed about myocytes, uh, myocardial necrosis, uh, uh, you know, cell death, uh, troponin, et cetera. And we have forgotten the extracellular matrix, the uh, fibrotic process, which goes hand in hand with uh, the remodeling. And uh, this has been also a very important revolution, uh, trying to uh, uh, enhance the level of interest in extracellular matrix as a very important target for the disease, not only for heart failure pumping function, but also in extra heart because fibrotic processes in the heart is also the same occurring in the kidney. So again, within the same framework of uh, systemic disease, but also understanding the pumping, but also the electricity, lots of electrical disturbances in the heart in heart failure are related to fibrosis, um, sometimes also in the atria, which is the really substratum of uh, atrial fibrillation. So these are the different progresses which has occurred in the uh, heart failure field. And if any, just a take home message that we need always to uh, look out of the box. That, that's great. Thanks a lot. And in, indeed, it's been very re rewarding working in heart failure the last two or three decades. Um, Filippo, I'd like to give over to you because uh, people are likely getting tired of me a little bit. <clears throat> well, the uh, history of cardiovascular medicine narrated by a protagonist is always really fascinating. Uh, before asking you the next question, uh, I invite our, uh, our audience to ask questions. You can use the chat button and ask questions and I will ask I ask your questions on your behalf. But my next question uh, is about cardiac fibrosis. You've been a pioneer also in the field of cardiac fibrosis. Uh, what about the past, the present, and the future of cardiac fibrosis? Well, the real pioneer was Carl Weber. Uh, he was uh, developed the, uh, again, related to aldosterone, showing the uh, antifibrotic effect of aldosterone independent from any effect on remodeling and on blood pressure. So I actually met Carl Weber at that time, and uh, we had since his work a really the obsession to show that what he's shown in animals was true in humans. And then when we had the uh, RALS trial, uh, I insisted to have a biobank, and, and this is, you know, in the late 90s. Uh, since then, uh, we really believe that any trial should have a biobank. There are so much to be learned from biomarkers and biomarker research. So this is a typical example whereby biomarker and collecting just blood and putting it in the fridge until the end of the trial was very useful. And at that time, uh, Carl Weber told me that we can actually measure fibrosis in the blood with cardiac uh, uh, fibrosis biomarkers, which were not necessarily really, we found out later, uh, cardiac specific. These are just fibrosis markers, collagen fragments. And we have measured that in the RAS trial. And the results were really outstanding. This was published in Circulation 2000. And actually, I received it since then, uh, it, you know, uh, a, a paper from the circulation journal because it went very quickly to be uh, one of the 1% top uh, cited publication because the finding was really outstanding. From these cardiac fibrosis biomarkers, collagen fragments, we found that these are very much related to prognosis, as strong as ejection fraction in itself. Not every heart failure patient had got fibrosis. The second demonstration is that indeed in placebo, the fibrotic rate didn't change at all, but people taking spironolactone had the 25 degrees in the level of these fibrosis. But the best part of the story is that when you categorize patients across uh, the full spectrum of ejection fraction, according to the bio profile related to that fibrotic level, we did a simple job, just above and below the median, right? Then below the median, 
we had hardly any effect of spironolactone, not only fibrosis, but on the outcome. Spironolactone was useless. And in patients who had uh, the highest fibrotic markers above the median, the magnitude effect doubled. In overall, we had 30% decrease in mortality in all population, but in patients with fibrotic profiles to start with, we had 50% decrease in death rate. So this was really an eye opener that uh, we can clinically at least get the you know, mechanism of action out of uh, the bench and do you know, mechanistic studies in humans and uh, not only you know, uh, understand better the mechanism of disease and the mechanism of uh, the drug effect, but also use this biomarker as potential uh, for the future personalized medicine. This was probably one of the, my first encounters of what we call now personalized medicine. Thank you, Payens, for this really nice perspective. I'm reading a, a comment uh, uh, from Elisa Del Valle, who's emphasizing what you said before, the importance in patients with heart failure of uh, comorbidities, in particular diabetes and CKD. Uh, uh, just a second, I come back to a comment uh, made before by Rudolf uh, about uh, aldosterone antagonists. And then he said, well, but now we use them every day. But uh, I remember, Fayez, that some time ago you used the expression, but these drugs are still the Cinderella in the treatment of heart failure. Why do you say so? Well, uh, this was about uh, the uh, safety profile, which is uh, similar to uh, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. You may remember that we made the life of our colleagues very complex. We needed them to monitor, to educate the people, the patient, to start low, go slow uh, with optimization medication. And then everybody has grown wary about you know, the manipulation and the use of this medication for wrong reason, because it's more about concern than real safety issues. Because if you apply the guidelines, hyperkalemia, for example, or Western renal infection is, is really unfrequent. And these are the very patient, again, getting back to renalism, right? The very patient who are in need of this medication that who eventually may develop side effects and who are deprived from this medication because of concern of uh, uh, side effects. So this was a, a real uh, element and again, another eye opener that we need not generate evidence. We need also to think about the implementation in the real world and uh, Therefore, we really need to need to do trials close as possible to the real world, but then do implementation of strategy trials in order to make sure that any evidence is being implemented and find out why it is not implemented when it's the case. And it has been the case for many medication in heart failure uh, because the manipulation of this medication is tricky. And by the way, this brings me to just highlight how much we are doing a bad job as heart failure specialists because Again, and I take it from my good friend, Milton Packer, who said, can you think of any cancer patient not being cared for by an oncologist? You cannot. Most of cancer patients sooner or later will hand land and be cared for by an oncologist. Most of our heart failure patients are cared for by general physicians, not even by cardiologists, uh, let alone with the heart failure specialists. And the manipulation of uh, drug therapy in heart failure is simple, much simpler than the manipulation of chemotherapy, but still it has some hurdles. So we need to work on implementation. And indeed, I spent 30 years of my life uh, generating evidence just to find out that like Sisyphus, we are really rolling the ball up there and the ball is falling again. And we are trying to roll the ball again up there and it's falling again. And we need to stop this vicious circle addressing more the implementation science. Uh, I have a related question from uh, Dr. Gobinda from Bangladesh. And this is the beauty of the European Art Journal. It's truly a global journal. And the question is very practical. What about the starting dose of, for instance, of spironolactone in patients with heart failure? Practical advices. 
Yeah, yeah. well, actually, indeed, as I mentioned uh, earlier on today, we found actually doses as low as 12.5 milligram are effective on anti-proBNP and actually in clinics, because in the most of MRI trials, we did manage the dose of up and down titration depending on real function and potassium. And actually, just as a reminder, because it may haven't really gotten through the emphasis trial with the Pleranon, we did stratify patients according to their EGFR to allow patients with low EGFR to use the lowest dose. And the benefit was absolutely equal in these patients with the lowest dose as compared to full dose in uh, pretty normal EGFR. So therefore you can live with the EGFR and you have to live with it because as I've said earlier, this is really so concomitant to heart failure. You only need to uh, play it well and monitor uh, the uh, potassium and renal function and uh, adapt the dose. But the lower dose of 12.5 milligram are effective. And uh, there are multiple other ways to keep patient on this medication, certainly when it comes to potassium, potentially uh, better education. Well, this is something, another message I'd like really to share with my friends, cardiologists, actually. Most nephrologists would sit down with their patient and educate them about uh, uh, potassium-rich food and about potassium diet. I can't remember of my colleagues in general physician or in cardiology really doing so. So this is one other you know, element of uh, implementing. Uh, we need to get all the picture in implementation, not only uh, prescribing a single dose, uh, which would fit everybody. Heart failure therapy is an art. So we really need to be uh, applying science, but also exercise uh, clinical judgment. Uh, let's change page, uh, trials. Uh, you've been the PI of seminar trials. What has been the most successful and the most disappointing? By the way, I see in our audience, uh, Carlo Patron and John Cleland who have large experience in trials. Please, Carlo and John, if you have questions, your questions are very welcome. I'm sure Thais will be happy to uh, address your questions if you have them. Uh, please, uh, Thais. Well, we have decided, and actually this was a spin-off of the CBCT meeting, that we will be not saying a negative or positive trial or successes or disappointments, right? We learn from each trial. Well, a success in your mind, I believe, and in my mind, is a trial which had led to change in practice. And I was very privileged to be one of the, uh, uh, be part of these trials, and certainly the MRA trials, RALS, Ephesus, Emphasis, and recently with Dr. John Cleland here, Homage, which is inpatient at risk of heart failure. And uh, I would also to remind uh, the CBIS story, which is very nice, actually. I was the steering committee with uh, Henry Doggy, who was conducting the steering committee. And uh, at some point, we had a sign <clears throat> that, uh, um, there was a trend toward uh, an excess benefit with uh, bisoprolol at that time. We had no strong evidence of mortality benefit. We decided to keep the trial rolling. It was a very tough decision because, of course, we uh, could uh, breach the integrity of the trial being unblighted. But luckily, very soon after this first decision, maybe one or two months later, the trend was really visible. And then we had to stop the trial prematurely. So this is another nice success story because CBIS and I was part of them and, and actually this is not necessarily known because we have decided that the in the Lancet paper, we will all sign up collectively the CBIS investigator. So there was no authors <laughs> in the list of CBIS. And, and uh, yes, this is certainly a very important success story. And late, of course, the empagliflozine story, uh, I had the privilege to lead the Emperor Reduced trial with uh, Milton Packer and be part of the Emperor Preserved with Stefan Anker and Javed Butler. And uh, this was also very disruptive. Uh, so I like these trial success stories because they are counterintuitive, right? Uh, this is typically depicting uh, um, uh, uh, Pasteur, you know, our famous French uh, uh, in, in, in the vaccinated world. He, he, uh, to quote him, he said that, uh, chance favors prepared minds. So, so we, we need always to have minds which are open to be prepared to anything uh, uh, happens which is out of the box. And these are three stories out of the box. Uh, again, 
um, in other words, to call them serendipity. Uh, we were not looking for heart failure when we started, you know, developing SGLT2 inhibitors. These were uh, diabetes medication, glucose lowering, right? And uh, beta blockers and MRA uh, were contraindicated in heart failure at some point. So these are real successes because of these various elements. There are many other lessons we have learned from multiple other trials, and I am not going to be spending much time on them, but I would like to highlight one trial. Of course, the many trials in acute heart failure were a disappointment because we really don't have a success story in acute heart failure, and I have been part of Everest, Astronaut, Commander HF with John Cleden and others. But the one I would like to mention is Serve HF. Serve HF under the leadership of Martin Cowey was testing, you know, uh, CPAP, ventilation in patient with central sleep apnea, which is frequent in patient with heart failure, with chain stroke uh, respiration. And um, it is really, you know, disturbing when you have a trial which finds the other totally unexpected result, because we ended up by having an increased cardiovascular death and more so sudden cardiac death in patient who are ventilated, despite they had a great you know, improvement in their breathing pattern, et cetera. So we corrected everything, but we made only the situation worse. And we are trying to struggle to understand why was that so. So we learn much from trials, even from ne negative ex experiences. And we have ongoing work with uh, on biomarkers in order to and, and understand this, uh, you know, uh, uh, un unexpected finding. Well, thank you for offering this uh, wise perspective in the interpretation of, of trials. And now, Fayez, a delicate ethical issue. Uh, are the others of trials sponsored by industry, uh, do they have full access to data? What, what is the, the true independence of, uh, of the others in a trial? What happens behind the scenes? Well, um, you, you, you mentioned the word delicate, and it is indeed delicate. Uh, uh, the uh, interaction between industry and uh, uh, academy is a delicate balance. It's based on trust, right? We need to trust each other. And so far, the trust is, is, is there. It's fine. But for some reasons, uh, there are occasionally some companies who don't like to share the databases. This is less and less common, I must say. And uh, <clears throat> there are rules of data sharing. <clears throat> Some of them are imposed by you, by editors of journal, by the way, but which are not mandating full data access. They only ask for the first author to certify that he has been given the chance to look at the data. Uh, now, there are some companies who do not share the uh, databases, and which is really pity. It can be for several reasons. Uh, of course, they raise reason that they need to work out their approval process, which is fine. And therefore, we may need to wait one or two years after approval until we can be accessing the database for further analysis. Trial databases are extraordinarily rich for science and knowledge production. And they are not harvested to their full potential. Uh, most of the time, especially, unfortunately, when the trials are negative, in the company, people will walk away, they will shelve the databases and they will forget about it. And we keep fighting in order to have access to it. Occasionally we have done a good job accessing data and producing lots of good science out of it. And if the trial is positive, of course, <clears throat> the sponsor for good reason, they may have uh, objective, which is the way to disseminate the result, right? Of course, within the framework of uh, um, uh, rightful interpretation of the data, but the prioritization of uh, what should come first may be different. And there may be some discrepancy about the interpretation of some data, which if the database is not shared and if the independence of uh, um, the steering committee and the investigator is not fully respected, then it may lead to some device, which is really uh, uh, not you know, uh, desirable. So it's not, uh, black and white. Um, we are making progress, uh, but there are still much progress to be done in companies to accept data sharing. There are lots of mechanisms to do so in a trustful way. Uh, the data sharing may be uh, under the coordination of the steering committee and the sponsor, 
with mutual agreement. So uh, there is no excuse uh, when companies say, well, um, we uh, are not uh, able to share the data. Sometimes they say, well, we have lots of statistical resources and data management, and this is really complex to navigate in this complex data basis, which is not true. Uh, many of our groups have developed good knowledge of data management and very high skillful statistical people. So hopefully we will make a better progress and for further data sharing, it should become the rule by the way. And with the independence of the academies uh, participating in the industry sponsored trials and also data sharing. Yeah, well, thank you. I think this is an important topic. And as you say, there's room for improvement. And I hope that also journals can help and will have a role in uh, improving the relation between others and, and big pharma, between academy and industry. And I think this is particularly important in the COVID era because the COVID era is showing that a sizable proportion of citizens, citizens do, not, do not trust science. I mean, the Novax movement is expression of lack of trust in, in science. Even the, the son of Bob Kennedy is a negationist. And this is remarkable. So, Fias, how can we improve the confidence of people, of patients, of citizens in science? Well, well, thank you for asking this question because obviously it's really, really uh, a very important on uh, uh, these times. I, I do believe actually that uh, we are very biased in cardiology because we breath oxygen without really realizing that we are breathing oxygen. We use evidence-based and uh, medicine and clinical trials so often it has become real standard practice. Most of cardiologists really understand, most of them, Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, hazard ratio, level of evidence, the guidelines have done a very big job you know, promoting this level of evidence and actually uh, at the latest European Society of Cardiology meeting, Stefan van der Ker, uh, in a session he just got me to acknowledge that in heart failure, 90% of our recommendations are based on heart evidence, 90%. Well, it's not the case in all cardiovascular fields. He recognized that in interventional cardiology, the rate of heart evidence and based uh, uh, guidance uh, is much lower. Uh, and this is just to get back to the public education. Uh, we are enjoying a great you know, understanding of the clinical trial and uh, evidence-based medicine. Our uh, junior fellows, uh, we need really to improve their education and certainly their residents about uh, the understanding of uh, evidence-based medicine, but more so general public. What we have found from this COVID crisis is the sheer ignorance of the general public of evidence-based medicine. Even when you come up with the highest possible evidence from clinical trials, they don't understand what is clinical trials. When I opened my interim clinical research facility, I had the chance to have a large places in a remote hospital from the city of Nancy uh, in the suburbs. It was in a small city called Toul. And one of the um, volunteers in a trial was a school teacher. And when he came and uh, wandered about and spent some time in the uh, clinical research unit, he said, well, this, what you are doing, we really don't know this at all. Would you mind coming and teach our kids about this? And I went, I discussed this with the kids. This same, the same experience we are having when in, you know, social uh, and, and, and friends discussing the level of evidence. There is sheer ignorance about that. And this takes me to a wish uh, that I've shared with you, um, uh, Filippo, is that our journals and ourselves get out of our comfort zone and go to patients and publish lay language journals. Patients need to be instructed about how strong our, is le our level of evidence. And uh, the European Society of Cardiology, I must say, I'm sorry, it hasn't really much of the activities oriented toward patient, the end users of everything we are doing every day. And uh, the guidelines, we immediately after publication, we all comply, complain that, well, uh, implementation is an issue uh, because we are not doing our job 
directed to the patient. So to have a short answer to you, your very important question, education about uh, randomization, the level of evidence, how strong is uh, the evidence is important, but it's important outside our comfort zone, getting to the general public, and you can do a good job at the European Heart Journal, having occasionally trial results published as a lay language journals, and maybe also assorted with some educational papers about the level of evidence, et cetera. And uh, there are brilliant patients who are ready to work this out. Uh, and I've met few when I've started uh, organizing the cardiovascular clinical trialist meeting. Uh, they are really, really demanding this kind of dialogue. Well, thank you for this uh, challenging perspective. But uh, I, I think that uh, it li challenges make life more interesting. And the challenge of involving patients in what we do, uh, including the journal activity, uh, is really a fascinating perspective. And uh, I strongly believe that we have to do more to improve the confidence of our uh, citizens in science. And this is an important way, an important perspective to achieve in order to achieve this important, important result. I'm sure Rudolf has got other questions. In the meantime, we are flooded uh, from questions uh, from the audience, uh, which shows that the dialogue today is extremely interactive and extremely entertaining. Rudolf, please. Yes, thank you, <clears throat> and I and I've, I fully agree. It's it's a it's a major challenge to have data implemented. But maybe, for yes, taking taking one step back. So so conducting a trial, designing a trial, uh, that's what you what you are very good at. And and then at some point, it it comes to uh, interpretation of of the trial results. Can you maybe share some of the challenges and and pitfalls that that you generally encounter and how to deal with them? Well, well, that's that, that's really um, what should make us busy now uh, in, in the next few years. We we have uh, a great medicines, uh, great evidence, uh, uh, but it's very, very insufficiently implemented, uh, which is really a pity and 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 in a way a disaster. <laughs> so. Um, uh, and, and of course, the clinical trial um, science and uh, generating evidence is very exciting. And I can see the real willingness and fight among the uh, junior colleagues to become future trialists uh, because it has become now, uh, you know, uh, attractive. We have been <clears throat> for some while, you know, complaining that most of our junior colleagues uh, would like to go for training in interventional cardiology, echocardiography, anything which is practical and uh, not much in clinical research. But over the last few years, we have really seen a wave of interest in uh, future clinical research and, and trials, but not much in implementation science. This is really something which is new, by the way, and uh, many methodologies are being evolved. Um, we have been using real world data, I'm sorry to say uh, not appropriately. It has been used more as marketing skills and uh, maybe also for, uh, you know, health economics assessment, but not necessarily as they should be, which is actually describing the behavior of a new medication in real world in order to understand where are the gaps and the shortcomings and fight for them and maybe redesign new trials. And the best way, and I'm certainly very much biased and obsessed about randomization, is to do randomized trials of implementation, implementation randomized trial. Compare strategies, strategies A to strategy B. Um, strategy A, which is based on forced up titration uh, compared to strategy B, which is uh, using concomitantly uh, potassium binders, for example, or health education, whatever. Um, also uh, remote monitoring and <clears throat> disease managed program. We have a very large body of evidence and actually I'm not sure that uh, our audience is aware today that uh, uh, disease managed program in heart failure has received uh, since the latest, I mean, uh, two rounds of guidelines, the uh, level of evidence A and strength of recommendation one, one A, as strong as use of beta blockers, MRA and whatever medication. Yet this is the least implemented recommendation and healthcare systems need to be restructured in order to have 
better care provided for heart, for heart failure patients. And uh, we, um, you know, oncologists are doing a wonderful job with these disease managed programs, not cardiologists and certainly not heart failure specialists. I have a, a sad memory of uh, a disease managed program I have developed in France, we called ICALOR, Insuffisant Cardiac and Lorraine, which was very successful. We have published that it decreased hospitalization by 40% and mortality by 30%. And it was so cost effective. Uh, you know, the health authorities in France gave me one euro, I ran them five euros, extremely cost effective. The silliness of the politics at that time made these uh, uh, adventures close up. So it was stopped altogether. So the, the challenges of our politicians understanding the work we are doing are very important. And we need also to develop a better public relation. Uh, of course, we always take as an example, oncologists who are doing a wonderful job, uh, but um, I don't know, we need to learn the lessons and the skills in order to promote a better care and better implementation of the results of evidence trials, and also a better implementation of uh, healthcare systems uh, with the highest level of evidence. Yeah, yeah, it's, I fully agree. It's, it's hard work in implementation. We need, we need to step up there. Um, and, and then, of course, there are examples where, where everything was done right. The, the trials came into the guidelines. And then in real life, sometimes translation cannot be achieved. And can, can you say something about reasons that, that might explain this? Um, are there results that make you somewhat suspicious on beforehand? You say, well, I'm not so sure about this. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to quote uh, Desmond Jonil, the uh, late Desmond, uh, who has been one of the founding fathers of ESC and of European Heart Journal, by the way, he was a very close friend. And at uh, one of the meetings, I listened to him saying that uh, we need to fight the, the multiple eyes, the eye of uh, ignorance, the eyes of incredulity, and the eye of inertia. You know, ignorance well, you are doing a good job, Filippo and others, uh, uh, with publication, and, and, and we can't really uh, have people ignorant about the evidence so far because the meetings are all there. Um, whether people trust the results, uh, well, our cardiology community are very well educated to understand the subtlety of clinical trial and the level of evidence, etc. But the three I, which is inertia, is really the main issue. We have data which people trust, uh, which people know, but they, show, they, they fall short of implementing it. So I, I, I don't know what, are the, uh, what is the trick to help you know, circumvent this inertia. And again, I'm getting my obsession lesson from oncology and from you know, disease management program. We cannot leave doctors alone. We need to help them. And uh, we can lead, uh, leave our heart failure patient uh, only dealt with uh, primary care and general physicians. We really need to have a decision management program. And I am a strong believer in this. And I would like to have the ESC promote this as well. And by the way, uh, when I was on board of the Heart Failure Association, I started an initiative which was called AIM High, which was actually in a way to uh, run a similar experience in Europe to the Get With The Guideline initiative in the United States, which uh, has multiple successes and which, if any, is meant to, uh, you know, fight inertia and help doctors implement the best science. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think from my side, I'll, I'll leave with that. Filippo, maybe you want to ask a final question or... or yeah. Wrap it up. Thank you, Rudolf. Well, uh, we are receiving many questions. I, I read two from our audience. Uh, one is from John Cleland. Uh, uh, do we need a universal definition of heart failure? Please, this can be the title of a session, a short answer. Yes, uh, well, I have co-authored uh, and uh, uh, with John and he's been kind of inviting me of his uh, universal definition of heart failure? And the answer is yes, because we were in the pro position. And I would like actually to go beyond this. And the history is going, giving us a few more elements of that. And certainly the story I told you about uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors being effective across the spectrum of ejection fraction. 
This means that uh, uh, the definition based on injection fraction, we may need to move away from it. Uh, and certainly we have multiple ways to risk stratify patient. Injection fraction is only risk stratifiers. This is a continuum. There are not uh, totally distinct uh, uh, you know, diseases. And, and therefore, yes, um, I, I believe we should aim to universal definition, but I, knew, I know that in the paper of John, uh, universal definition, he uh, was making the comparison with uh, uh, acute curry syndromes and coronary artery disease based on uh, troponin. And as a shortcut, we would like uh, the definition of heart failure based on PNP. Uh, and the rest is, is just different presentation of the disease and different sides of severity. So yes, I, I really believe that we should aim to a unified uh, universal definition of heart failure. Thank you, Fayez. And now let's come to your baby. You are the mastermind behind CBCT. This is one of the most exciting meetings in the world dedicated to the science of uh, clinical trials. Well, tell us more. The, how did it start and uh, what, what, what is the future? Well, uh, you have heard my passion for clinical trials. And uh, because of this passion, I thought there wasn't a single space dedicated to the clinical trial science. And uh, we have started this with Bert Pete our, after our first encounter with uh, the context of trials. So we have developed this trial and we thought this um, uh, meeting and, and, and actually it's going to be running uh, from December the 2nd, so in a week. Uh, and it's all free and all virtual live. Uh, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th of December. Uh, this meeting, what it has uh, a special feature is that this is the single place where you may in the same room have patients and patient advocates, major journal editors, and thank you, Philip, for being part of the uh, show, uh, major regulators. We have uh, 50 people from the FDA attending this meeting. We have the European Medical Agency, EMA, the NIH, lawyers, payers from Medicare, NICE, and multiple stakeholders. Because the every question you really asked today needs to be addressed from all the different angles. Uh, it's not only evidence generation, if it's, it's about interpretation. We have lots of statistical uh, people in order to understand the uh, interpretation. It's also about implementation. It's an implementation is also reimbursement, pricing, valuation of the evidence by payers. And uh, of course, at the end of the day, you have also use of this medication and adherence and understanding by the patient. So we needed also patient to be around the table. All of these are speakers in a single session and all of these end up by any typical session by a large moment type of moderated debate, which eventually come up with really creative thinking and new ideas, which eventually make, make it to draft manuscript as position statement papers. And we have published a few in Europe and Hard Journal. Again, thanks, Filippo. And, and, and therefore, uh, people praise this meeting also as a boutique Congress because it's close uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, it, there is lots of camaraderie and it has really grown to be a community, the CBCT community. So we really, uh, invite you to get on board and uh, connect uh, any day or the four full days from December 2nd to December 5th soon. Thank you. Thank you, Faiz, for this update on your important meeting. And I have one final question. This is something I ask all our guests. How can we improve ESG dialogues? Um, uh, well, I, I wish uh, I can circle back to my other obsession, which is involving patients. Uh, lay language publication, uh, listen to patient views. There are so smart patients who have bring in their patient experience, but they have grown expertise to understand the evidence and have a dialogue with the patients. We have 30 such patients attending every year who has become uh, a new word we have created for them, patient trialists. So involve patients. And, and the other thing is, uh, we have published a paper recently about diversity in leadership. Uh, if you look at the uh, lead authors and main authors of uh, the main journals, uh, although uh, they are involving work which has been uh, done you know, in uh, multiple countries on a global scale, 
uh, the uh, rate of women and ethnically diverse and geographically diverse lead authors is very low. And it has been staying low over the last 10 years, maybe less than 10%. And there are ways to uh, improve knowledge production from different regions in the world. And there were ways to, you know, uh, invite and involve uh, ethnically diverse, geographically diverse, and certainly more women into these leadership positions. So this is my uh, wish and hopefully not wishful thinking. Well, thank you for your suggestion. I'm proud to say that the number of women in our editorial board increased from five to 25. Good. We can do, <laughs> thank you, we can do better, but perhaps we are on the right track. Well, this concludes our dialogue today. Uh, it's been one hour, one very pleasant and interesting hour. I, I would like to thank Rudolf, our associate editor for heart failure and the FIES, uh, the one of the monuments of, uh, of cardiovascular medicine. Thank you for joining us. And I remind you, our audience that the next dialogue will be on December 30th at uh, 5 uh, p.m. CET. The European Art Journal never raced and we will have a dialogue immediately before the end of the year. So please join us on December uh, 30th at 5 at 17 CET. Again, thank you, Fayez and Rudolf, for this very exciting dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind invitation. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And we'll just wait for everyone to sign off. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Uh, it has been a wonderful experience. You made it very enjoyable. Thank you very much, uh, Fayez. It was indeed very interesting. Great journey. Wonderful. Thank you for this privilege. Uh, very enjoyable. Uh, hopefully, it has been entertaining our colleagues. <laughs> yeah, well, we received a, a large number of questions, which is, uh, of course, a good sign, involvement of, of the audience. Good. And uh, it has been really a great perspective, from trials to ethics to history of uh, heart failure, really, really uh, enjoying. Okay, uh, I think that we are, uh, all, all the windows are almost closed and- uh, Few people hang around. Few, few uh, yeah. other colleagues around. It's really <coughs> a, global, yeah. a global audience. Traditionally, the 